I received another great question. So what we're going to talk about today is how to build a storage library, a, a, a class library that you can use to upload files in, for example, the web application to multiple different sources, such as, for example, Amazon S3 or, or Dropbox, and also uh, with multiple different files, or you can upload multiple different files, such as, for example, photos and videos. But we're not going to talk about sort of the nitty gritty details of the code, but rather we are going to talk about sort of, uh, we're going to talk about that on sort of an architectural level, on, on sort of, well, if you're facing that kind of problem, how should you go about, or let me sh rather say, how could you go about structure that on a, on a more sort of uh, abstract level or sort of on the architecture level? So if you've ever struggled with constructing a solution for file uploads, definitely stick around because hopefully this video will be useful and interesting for you. So anyways, let me now switch mode so that I'm actually addressing you, the person who actually asked that question. So, so as I told you before, like, first of all, again, Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great question and it's a, it's a very interesting question and thank you for the level of detail that you provided me. So what I think we're going to do is I'm going to start by reiterating the fact that you've given me or sort of reiterating the question that you're posing me uh, in the hopes of ensuring that I understand you correctly and also that gives you an opportunity to see, uh, well, if I say something that you found find particularly strange, then, then you can know whether, uh, whether that's because I'm misunderstanding the, the thing that you're actually asking, uh, or, 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 or I mean, you can know whether it's because I'm misunderstanding the thing that you're asking or whether I'm just saying something that's completely crazy. But anyways, let, let's actually get into it. So <clears throat> the way I inter interpret what you're saying, so you're attempting to um, build a, or, or actually I shouldn't say attempt, clearly you've successfully built, but now you're thinking more in terms of, well, I've got this thing working, how do I uh, improve the architecture? How do I increase the level of abstraction such that when I have changes in the future, uh, it won't be painful? That's, that's sort of the, the, the general take, I guess, on, on the, the, the scenario that you're facing. But um, I interpret it as that you're saying that, okay, you're building something that hypothetically could be exposed as an open source library. I'm not sure if it is an open source library that you're building or, or whether it's part of an, uh, an actual application, but either way, um, let's start in this end. I think you're saying that there are multiple different, let's say, let's call them uh, storage solutions, right? So there are multiple different storages, but also there are m multiple different uh, storables. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple different... Is that actually visible? Yeah, it seems like that's visible. Uh, so there are multiple different storables and there are multiple different storages. Now, now what do I mean with these? I, I'm just putting or introducing some kind of vocabulary so that we can sort of sensibly talk about this. So, so storages, I mean, you talk a lot about S3, for example, so Amazon S3, but I assume that another example would be something like Dropbox or uh, is it called the Google Drive? maybe change name, but anyways, like there are multiple different sort of third party storage solutions to which you want to upload files. Uh, and then there are multiple different, uh, or, or actually, this is, so let's write uh, DB here as well for, for Dropbox. When I write DB now, I mean, I mean Dropbox here. Uh, and then there are multiple different types of storables. So there are multiple different types of things that you might want to store, such as, for example, an image, such as, for example, a video, and maybe, let's say, uh, generically, uh, maybe a document such as maybe a PDF or something like that, right? And, and so one way that I've been thinking about these things lately is I've been thinking about the sort of axis of variation or the dimension over which an application or a solution is um, uh, affords variation, let's say. So we want to, in the ideal case, we would want to build an application or an architecture, construct an architecture that can vary across storages and it can vary across storables. So in other words, you can pair up any, you can, you can uh, if you can upload images, then you should be able to upload images to both S3 and, and DB. And if you can upload videos, you should be able to upload videos to both S, but to both S3 and DB. But, but it's, it's what I mean when I say sort of the axis of variation, or, or maybe we should think about it as sort of degrees of freedom, is that you can change these. So you could introduce another one, which is, for example, let's say, uh, let's say GD for, for Google Drive or G Drive or whatever they call it. 
Uh, and by introducing G drive, you would also, I mean, it depends on how nested this is. So when introducing G drive, you might have to introduce these things as well. But, but either way, when introducing that, you would somehow get these, these things uh, as well. Uh, so you would get the storables. And, and again, so, so now I'm expressing this as, as, as if it's sort of this uh, Cartesian product scenario, where it's like you have, a, you have all the storables times all of the storages. Right, so so like you can you can take you can upload a video to S3 or sorry an image to S3, but you can also upload it to Dropbox, but you can also upload it to Google Drive. But then you can upload a a video to S3 and then to uh, Dropbox and then to Google Drive and so forth. Like it's it's a many to many. So it's like the, the number of things that we have here times the number of things that we have here. And maybe maybe that doesn't make sense in your scenario. Maybe you actually want to only upload particular things to particular places. So let's say, I mean, let's say YouTube, for example, right? So, so if you introduce YouTube as a storage solution, of course, it doesn't maybe make sense to use YouTube as, a, as an image storage solution, right? I think the thing I'm, or oh, sorry, <laughs> I think the thing I'm about to propose, or at least talk about, would somehow support that, but I haven't, <laughs> Actually, I mean, this is pretty interesting. I haven't really thought about this whole thing sort of end to end. So, so we'll see where we end up uh, with this. Uh, but, but hopefully I'll be able to provide at least some useful insight. But anyways, um, with YouTube, you maybe don't want to upload images and documents. You maybe only want to have videos. So somehow there needs to be some solution for that restriction. But, uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, or hopefully I'll remember to, to touch on that in the end as well. But let's move on. So, so this is kind of the, the, the scenario that we're in, right? We're trying to build this, this library such that, okay, so that you, you have this, uh, this, this file, file library, file upload library, yeah, file upload library, and, and sort of this black box, right? Where it's like you can build your application here, your normal app, and it communicates with this file, uh, file upload library, whether that's sort of exposed to others as well. So it's like, a, well, if you're in, in JavaScript, it'd be like an NPM module, or if you're in Ruby, it'd be like uh, a GAM, right? So whether it's like a, a GAM that you install or whether it's like uh, something that's within your application, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But like, let's assume that there's somewhat of a clear boundary where you, try, you are attempting to construct something that is general and reusable and not actually strictly tied to your application. Okay, so that's sort of my assumption on where we're going, like the bigger picture. But let's now talk about the specifics. I mean, if I, if I sort of parse the text that you've sent me, it, it, uh, it seems like, uh, or let me actually put it this way. Uh, I would say that in my humble opinion, I think you've done a great job in identifying the sort of big moving pieces, or maybe not the moving pieces, but rather as in like the, the flow of the things that need to be done on a higher level, right? I think you're thinking about your problem in terms of, well, somehow we need to do something that looks kind of like this, and then we need to do something that kind of looks like this, and then we need to do something that kind of looks like this, and so forth, right? So you're like, it seems to me that you're really identifying the bigger strands of the things that need to be done, right? And in my mind, I guess that would be like the first step before we can think about architecture in any, any meaningful sense. But anyways, uh, so if I outline those things, right? Like, let me, let me remove this stuff, okay? So let's say you're specifically talking about S3, so Amazon S3. Uh, but I guess, I mean, so that's the flow for S3 and maybe the flow is slightly different for other things, but I think probably we're capturing, I mean, probably we'll, we'll capture uh, the flow at a sufficiently general level such that we would be able to capture any storage under that un under this sort of model. But it seems like you're saying that, okay, first, the first thing that needs to be done is that a, a sort of signed URL or something like that. I think you call it a signed, yeah, pre-signed URL. Sorry, so, so pre-signed pre -signed URL is generated. Uh, let, me, let me actually, let me, let me say that instead, right? Like you, you generate a URL generate a URL. And, and, and what this means is that you talk to S3 and you get a URL back and then the client can use that URL to upload their file. So, so that's where they will send the file. So I assume that at this point you have some information about what file the user is trying to upload, like maybe the storable type, like maybe you know whether it's an image, a video or a document. I'm not sure 
that we need to make that distinction yet. I think you are probably more aware of whether you need to make that distinction or not. Like, does the metadata, metadata associated with the thing that the user uploads, is that created here and does that vary across different storable types? So like, let's say that you have, for example, a title uh, and, and maybe a description, let's say. So if all of these types have a title and a description, then you know, maybe we don't need an image type and a video type and a document type for storables. Maybe we just need to talk about storables. So hopefully, it's, I'll, I'll assume that we can do that at this point. And of course, sorry, another field that you're talking about is something along the lines of, of user ID or something like that. So we know who uploaded the file, right? So, so that's the first step. And then the user sends a file to that URL. So the user starts to upload. But then what happens is that we enter step two. And step two uh, is that an event comes back, right? So if, if, the, if the user, so let's think about it, like let's say there's the user, uh, there's our application. No. No, wait, let's think about it. So, so there's the user, there's, the, there's S3, right? So let's say user, uh, yeah, actually, not like an entity. So if I'm trying to draw something that sort of looks like a data, data flow diagram, then it's our application, right? So it's more like something like that. Like the user requests to, that it want, the user says that they want to upload a file. We give the user a file. The user starts to upload the file. So actually, I mean, I'm not entirely sure how that process works. I, I wasn't able to fully get that. You, you, were, you were mentioning that you're building something where the file can be uploaded without first being uploaded to your server, which I think makes a ton of sense, right? But I'm not entirely sure on, on the details of how that's implemented. So maybe this interaction I'm getting slightly wrong. Apologies, please sort of sort that out in your head because I, I think hopefully you can follow along what I'm saying anyways. So anyways, the user somehow initiates that upload, but then uh, that upload sort of ends up at S3, right? Because the user uh, either, I'm not, so again, like I'm not sure if that goes via your system, so it ends up in S3. Let me actually, so let me put it like that, right? Or whether it sort of goes outside, as in that the user sort of manually uploads towards that link, I'm not sure, but anyways. Um, but then you get an event back from, from S3. And, and that's where we are now. S3 says, okay, well, there was a file uploaded. But since these things happen into, at two different points in time, right? They happen sort of synchronously, but not asynchronously as in like, there's a promise because it's not like a, a promise that resolves that like you start to upload the file and then you get a resolve of that promise. It's more like you start to upload a file and then any time later, suddenly you get a, you get a callback where, or, or I, uh, rather, I make the assumption, I assume that what happens is that S3 will call a URL on your server and will send you some data. So it, they will send you some ID. So, so that's what I'm assuming happens. If, it's, if, if you get a, back a promise, or if you, if, if rather, <laughs> if it's a request that resolves, then the situation is easier. But then I think you can sort out the, the um, I think you can make the parallel between what I'm talking about now and, and if the case is like that. If, if it's a promise, I, I hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, I'm going to assume that this is an interaction where the callback quotation marks from, from S3 happens by them calling a URL on your web server that you've specified. If that's not the way the interaction works, uh, I, I assume, or if that's not the way the interaction works, I, I assume that uh, you can still apply sort of the, the, the bigger picture of what I'm saying to your particular scenario. Apologies if I'm misunderstanding. But anyways, you get some kind of a callback back, right? And, and that's, the, that's, the second, that's the second thing, right? And what we do then, well, let's actually just say it. So, so there is a callback, right? There is some kind of callback. And what we need to do then is we need to match the callback uh, with the generated URL, uh, with generated URL. So, so if, if we start to introduce some terminology in order to try to sort of make this a bit easier, what we could say is that we could say, well, actually, this whole generate URL thing, what happens here first is that you have some kind of request, right? You're initiating some kind of file up upload. Let's call that a request, okay? Then there's a callback. Sorry, I shouldn't have said callback. I should maybe have said uh, event or notification, let's say, right? Let's say, and then there is a notification. Notification. 
okay? And that notification contains a response, right? And then I mean a response as in that they're saying, I mean, it's not, I, I don't mean as an HTTP response, I mean metaphorically a response in the sense that something was up, uploaded. But for us, in, in the context here, we should consider that a response. And what we need to do then is that we need to match we need to match the request that we had before with uh, the response. So actually, maybe, maybe I should say it this way, right? Find request matching of the response. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the next thing that we need to do. So, so the, the way you're outlining this is that you're saying that, well, what happens here when we make this request is that this request is saved into the database so that we know that the user is uploading a file and we have, because here, I mean, here we save, for example, the user ID, right? So, so, so the request contains the user ID. So in order for us to know within, within our application here, who, who the person was that uploaded that file, we need to match this response that we get back. We need to match that somehow with the initial request that contains the user ID, uh, which makes sense, right? And, and again, I'm sort of just still outlining the things that you have already solved, but, but I'm just trying at the same time to introduce some terminology so that we can approach it using that terminology, right? So, so that's the third thing that happens. Well, what's the next thing? Well, um, Hmm. So, so you're saying you're saying it in terms of well, we update, uh, we update the the file. What did you, yeah, we update the the entity, right? The entity that like was saved in the data database. The request that was saved in the database. We update that with the information that was contained in the response. Um, so, so I would maybe say it this way rather than thinking of that as an update. Let's think of that as the construction of a file, right? So, so a request plus a response uh, yields, or maybe is equal to, I don't know, I mean informally, right? Informally, we're saying yields a file. So not until now, I would, I would argue, should we talk about a file, right? It's like we construct an upload request and then at some point later, we get back an upload response and the upload response contains I mean, the ID of the file. And from this ID of a file, you're saying you can find the link at S3. So, but then if we take the request and match that with the response, then that should give us enough information to construct what, what we should call a file in, within the realms of the application. Like, I mean, it's still not a file, of course, it's, it's a, it's an instance that, that, point, that uh, gives us methods that, that we can use to find URLs uh, at which the file actually resides, right? Because it's, it's uploading to S3 and not to our actual server, right? Just to be clear, right? But, but at that point, I think maybe we should start to call it a file, but not before, right? Is there another step? Let's see. Yeah, okay, and, and, then, and then there's this thing, uh, you call it version URLs, which I think make a lot of sense, right? So, so then there's a step of, uh, let's say, interpretation or reorganization or parsing. I think, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but I think maybe this is what you refer to as serialization. I'm not sure if serialization is a conventionally appropriate term for this particular scenario, because I guess serialization is often used when we are, let's say, when we have when we have an object in memory and we want to turn this object in memory into a string that we can sort of send out of the bounds of the application. So in, in that sense, if it's a request that comes in, I, I guess maybe we could even see it as deserialization rather than serialization. But, but still, I'm not sure if that's conventional either. So, so I would think of this more, I, I guess maybe as parsing, right? It's like you get back an ID, right? So like, uh, when this thing that you get back from S3 when uh, within your response, right? You get a, a response here back and in that response there's an ID of the file that was uploaded. And if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is that from this ID you can generate a URL, HTTPS, da -da 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 -da, under which the file resides. And you can also generate multiple URLs 
because if it's an image that, that you uploaded, right? If you uploaded an image to S3, then S3 will generate multiple uh, versions of that image in sort of varying sizes. Well, that's a very strange thing to draw. It's like a non-squared image turned into uh, whatever. Uh, right, so, so, and that might be true for videos or I, I don't know, like you, you could definitely see how, uh, let me put it this way, I think you, you are sort of phrasing this appropriately because it seems to me that you're thinking of this as sort of a general idea where it's like, well, it's not just that images can have multiple different representations, any file can have multiple different representations and this is why you're saving it in sort of this uh, this hash or this key value pair uh, dictionary where keys are pointing towards different different URLs. But the point is, of course, that these URLs need to be generated somewhere. And uh, I mean, here, just, I, I guess, quick pause for reflection. Like, if, if it would be okay to generate that uh, always or to, to consider that a computed property, I think it would make sense to consider that a computed property in the sense that you don't actually have to save those URLs in the database. Rather, you save the ID, uh, you save the ID, and then whenever you need the URL, you generate the URL from the ID. Like, I wouldn't think that that's controversial. But maybe you actually want to save uh, the URLs. Fine, I mean, maybe that makes sense. So, so then somebody needs to generate these URLs such that they can be saved in the database. Actually, let's, let's try to complete, complete this flow, right? So let's, let's call it interpretation or, um, yeah, interpretation is also a strange word, right? Because it's like, it's really like a computed property, right? It's like, well, actually, let's say, let's say that, right? So like, let's say compute properties, compute, compute, uh, let me just say props, right? So compute further properties about this about this file that we've now generated. Somebody needs to be responsible for that, and maybe that's in this step four, maybe it's not. Mm, let's figure it out as we go along, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's it's kind of capturing all of the different pieces that you're outlining. And then somewhere, I think you were mentioning something about a, an upload directory, so also, somewhere we could specify a particular upload directory. And I'm not sure if that's specified by S3 or if that was specified in the request. I mean, if it's in the request, it's fairly straightforward, right? Because then it's just, it's a matter of putting that along the metadata of the request. But if it's in, in the, uh, if, if it comes back in the response, what file it happened, or what, what folder it happened to be Placed in maybe that doesn't make any sense. I, I wouldn't. I would assume that that's not the case. But but if that is the case, then that we should consider, I guess, somehow a part of this these computed properties. That's sort of a thing that we need to structurally store uh, when constructing something new, like let's say the file. So actually, now that I think about it, right, this thing of computing the properties probably need to go in into this process, right? When we go from a request plus a response and turn it into a file, somewhere in that transformation there needs to be this notion of, of computing properties. Okay, <laughs> quick breather, let's think about this. So, so this is what I think is, or my interpretation of, of sort of your question, and <laughs> how would I approach this? I, th I think we're kind of answering it now, right? By introducing this terminology, because probably you're also seeing how this terminology would sort of map over to classes and, and then instances, right? So I think one important realization to make, I was thinking a bit about this and then I, I thought, hmm, okay, well, uh, it might be that this is a case of visitor pattern, for example, or something like this, because we have this sort of two, two hierarchies, but, um, or sorry, I wasn't actually thinking about those two hierarchies in that sense. I was thinking about, let's say, uh, you can have a bunch of different requests and you can have a bunch of different responses and maybe we need to match these two up and different cases or different things might happen in different scenarios. But actually, it's not, ma it's not really that because um, it doesn't make, like, let's say we are making a request to S3 but we get back a response from Dropbox. Like that just sort of fundamentally shouldn't happen in the application. Like 
and if that if something like that happens in the application we're in a state where it's like well either you throw an exception like this is an unrecoverable error or you silently fail because this doesn't mean anything and then you log it somehow so i'm, I'm not going to think too much about this i'm just kind of going to assume that things line up but but this deserves some more thinking this this i would think carefully about and try to figure out how to how to approach that anyways um how to move forward so yeah ah sorry <laughs> what i was about to say is i think an important realization to make is that or a realization i mean i shouldn't say it like that uh, an important point is that you control the requests that you're making to s3 and and then i assume that you somehow control what callback s3 makes to you so i would make the distinction between uh so potential okay sorry again axes axes of variation maybe i would construct different urls for different storables maybe maybe but definitely i would cons construct different urls for uh different storages probably actually now that i think about it probably also for storables because images probably so s3 images probably need to be treated differently you need to compute different things ah definitely we need to do that right then uh, then dropbox images for example because dropbox maybe doesn't generate multiple different versions of an image but and similarly s3 videos need to be treated differently from from s uh, from uh, s3 images let's say for example so okay so that means we would need to generate callback URLs that would look like you create some standard that you decide yourself, which would be something like, well, S3 image, right? And they, so Amazon calls you back on that URL and provides you some data, uh, and provides you some response data. The reason I'm saying that's important is because it's really important here that we keep track of the files. And this is actually very powerful. Think about it this way. So, I think I talked a bit about this in another video I made on, on replacing conditionals with polymorphism. Like, uh, replacing conditionals with polymorphism in sort of object-oriented programming is fantastic as long as we are within the boundaries of our application. But as soon as we leave the sort of controlled world of our own application and venture out into the unknown where we have user input and HTTP requests and like we have to deal with primitive data types such as strings and numbers, then suddenly replacing conditionals with polymorphism becomes really difficult. So the reason I'm saying that is that if we are in the scenario where you can actually control the URLs that the storage calls you back on, so let's say that the, the URLs that S3, Amazon S3 actually calls you back on, then, then this problem becomes much less uh, difficult, or actually we can sort of replace conditionals with the polymorphism because when we get the response, in this sense, when we get the notification back from S3, if we've asked them to call a specific URL, then and we know which URL that is, then we can design it such that we know what we're getting back. So we can trivially match, I'm not saying the IDs of the user, right? Like that sort of uh, problem still exists, but uh, actually, but what I mean is the type of the request and the type of the response. So if it's, if it's an, uh, again, like if so, we have the storables and we have the storage, right? So if it's an image that's being sent to S3, then we can construct the URL such that if we if we get a callback, if we get a notification on this particular URL slash S3 image, then we know that it is an S3 image. So we don't have to sort of ninja parse the the uh, the, the response in order to figure out where it comes from and what it is. So that's pretty convenient. So that means that when we are, uh, I guess here right in in the notification when we get a response back we can we can know what kind of response we're getting but okay that, that was sort of a parenthesis that i wanted to, to to emphasize that i think that realization and maybe you've already made this realization is, is in my mind kind of kind of important that if you can can do that 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 further cleans up the design uh, and that further means that well i shouldn't say I shouldn't say that it alleviates, alleviates the problem that we were talking about before when you would have a request of one type 
that would lead to a response of a different type. That, that problem actually still exists. And if we choose that kind of solution, we're actually implicitly assuming that this never happens. And if that would happen, maybe we would actually have sort of unintended, unintended consequences and accidental uh, exceptions. Okay, but, but then what? Let's, let's try to make a few things a bit more concrete. Well, so, okay. Let's, let's try to map this sort of process of steps kind of onto code, right? Let's, let's actually, let's, let's remove this stuff, right? So, so okay, so, so this request somehow would probably be, I, I would guess, so let's, let's, let's do this in sort of UML style. So I would say uh, that there exists a, a request class and that request class a request is instantiated when the user initiates a request and it has some particular fields such as for example the user ID so that we know what to map it to and again maybe we have multiple different multiple different subtypes of requests where we have images and we have um, videos and so forth, it's just completely confused. <laughs> okay, so, so, so we have multiple different subtypes of requests. I, I got a bit confused because I was thinking about maybe it also varies across the dimension of different storage types and not just of storable types. So again, maybe maybe we would have like an uh, S3 request, but, but I would assume actually maybe not, right? Because probably the thing that varies there is the URL that you want to invoke in order to upload the file. So probably they don't have to vary across the dimension of storages but maybe they would have to vary across the dimension of storables if the metadata is different between these different types. But if the metadata is not different, I would try to keep them as one type for the sake of simplicity, right? So let's say we have these requests and, and maybe they have some other properties, right? So the requests are instantiated when, uh, upon this sort of step one, when we try to upload a file, okay? Then there's probably some kind of ORM where we're saving this, this request into, into the database. So let me just draw this sort of table to indicate that, okay, well, we'll we put that into, into the database, right? So let's, let's, for the sake of simplicity, let's think of in-memory storage, right? Like let's think of only during the lifetime of the application. So, so the request, the instance, the, the request is sort of saved into a collection of requests that are sort of pending requests. So actually, let's, let's, let's use UML and let's, let's draw it that way, right? And then, and then you can, if you think of it in terms of a, of a database, you should map it towards your ORM, right? Like, so we have some collection of uh, re, uh, requests. So it's a bit unusual to, some, why am I drawing this incorrectly? Sorry, well, let's just redraw this. So I guess it's a bit in unconventional to, <laughs> to call a class uh, in plural or pluralized like this. It's called requests. So sorry, maybe this should have been called request collection. But, but anyway, so this is a collection of, of requests. So a, re a request collection has requests, right? So yeah, so it has maybe requests. Yeah, maybe it doesn't have that property. Who knows? Let, let's just not even think about it. So so requests aggregates or, or has many requests. And these are sort of the pending requests. These, this is the way I'm thinking about requests. Like maybe you would save these requests forever for some reason, I don't know. But, but I think it would spontaneously make sense to clean up this collection of requests whenever a request happens to be fulfilled. But okay, so the request contains some, some information. And I don't know, maybe this request is just sort of a, a value object that just carries some data surrounding the request maybe it's actually something that can be invoked such that it has uh, the request method, for example. So like you construct the request and then you invoke the request. I don't know, I mean, it depends. Uh, I, I think it might make sense to do either of those. Uh, again, that's, that's probably, it's difficult for me to say because I'm not entirely sure of the sort of what, what your application does and what, what's delegated to someone else. And, but anyways, so, so either of those would be fine. And even if request is just a value object, then maybe there is somebody else, another class that, that, that sort of is responsible for actually making the request and then constructing a request object that can be saved in the database, right? Or rather that can be put into this collection of requests. So let's say that we have this collection of requests, right? That's, that's sort of, okay, this one done, right? We've kind of done that, okay. Then we have this notification thing. Okay, so there's a notification that comes back. And let's just think about it some, from the perspective of, let's say, 
So an MVC application, uh, a Rails application, right? If you're in a controller and you get a, if you're in a controller because you've, you've gotten a, a, a response back, right? That's maybe the context that we're in. Or, yeah, I mean, you're hitting a particular URL, so you're at, at a particular code in the, <laughs> you're at a particular place in the code where you know that a particular URL has been hit. And again, as, as we were drawing with this example URL down here before, we were saying that if we construct the URLs smartly, right, or, or, or carefully, we can know what response we're getting back. So, so somehow there needs to be a response type, right? The question is who constructs that response type? And I wouldn't say that this is the, uh, when, I, or rather, when I say response here, I don't mean like the pure raw HTTP response, N not that, but rather I mean when you're in that place, when you're in that controller, or you're in that uh, route handler or whatever you want to call it, right? That this place that handles the fact that there, this request has come in, that thing should construct a request, right? I mean, as, as soon as possible, we should leave. It's like, right, right, this is maybe a sensible way to think about it. At least this is the way I'm thinking about object-oriented programming. Because the fundamental unit of abstraction in, in object-oriented programming is the object, right? We should, as soon as we're dealing with primitives, we should as soon as possible leave the land of primitives so that we can replace conditionals with a polymorphism, right? Because primitives are not subject to polymorphism or are not subject to replacing conditionals with polymorphism. When we're in primitive land, we have to do switches and ifs and all of that stuff. But when we're in object land, <clears throat> we can simply dispatch to objects. We can send messages to objects, right? And that's what we want to be because that's where we can replace conditions with polymorphism. So, so, so that's the reason why I'm saying that we should as soon as possible leave the land of I have this HTTP response or I'm in this controller and move into something that we control ourselves. Well, actually, I mean, we do control the controller, so that would be a bit silly uh, for me. But, but then I guess the argument would be that we should leave the context of Rails, for example, right, or Express, if we're in Express, or whatever framework we're happy to using, or we're happy to be using, right? Think of Robert C. Martin, right, who says that the web is a delivery mechanism, right? You should marry your whole application to the web. Your application has purpose on its own, like it, it solves problem, it solves problems regardless of, of uh, regardless of, of whether it happens to be within the context of the web or not. And I think clearly it seems like you're realizing this because you're sort of building this general file uploader. So anyways, uh, we, get, we get a response and that thing should be, uh, that sh thing should be turned into an object. And, and the reason I talked about those different, different URLs is that probably then we would have different response types, right? Where it's like, well, depending on, again, what, what axes of variation you need, but then here we might have, like if we go most granular, we might have S3 image, S3 video, sorry, it's too tight, and maybe drop box image, and so forth and so forth, right? You have, you have as many different types as you need. So the correct response is instantiated when you have a response uh, at a URL, <clears throat> which is uh, appropriate for that response or uh, this kind of makes no sense. I think you're seeing, I think you see what I'm saying, right? Like the, the, res, the, the URL determines which of these types should be instantiated. Okay, and then what? Well, well let's, let's just simply look at the list, right? So actually now we can cross off number two. We've, we've got the notification, we've got some sort of abstraction around the idea of this, of this notification. Um, wh wh what do we do then, right? So, so step three is to find the request of the response, right? To match the, the corresponding request from this collection of requests uh, with the response that we now have. So, so then it's this classic question in object-oriented programming, right? Like who should be responsible for this? I guess since we now have a response, either it's the responsibility of the response to find uh, its, its matching request, or it's, a responsib or it's the responsibility of something else, right? Either we pass the response to something else that defines the request, or the response itself finds its matching request. So, I mean, I don't know, spontaneously, I guess both would work, but if you think about tell, don't ask, for example, it says that you should tell objects what to do rather than to ask them for information and then make decisions on its behalf. So under that, I guess maxim is an appropriate term, under that idea, uh, the response should itself be uh, responsible for 
locating the, the, the request that it matches with, because response has access to its own parameters, such as then, if we get back an S3 image, we probably get uh, the, the file ID, right? Which is the thing that we get back from Amazon, uh, and, and that's the thing that we need to, to match with the request. And actually, if, I think, if we think about it, right, that's maybe not a bad idea because maybe the way we need to match the response with the request varies between S3 and Dropbox, let's say. Hypothetically, maybe it even varies between image and video, maybe. But if it doesn't, maybe we could reuse the implementation somehow. But let's say that it varies, right, for now. So then it would probably actually make sense for response to say, okay, well, there are different subtypes of me, but definitely if I'm a response, I need to have a, I have a method that finds the request, right? So, so let's actually just say find request. And that needs to take something uh, which, which is a collection of requests, right? So, so it would take uh, this thing, right? It would, it, would, it would take a, let me now actually call it collection, or sorry, I guess a request collection would be the thing that I should have called it. Uh, yeah, so let me call it a rec collect, a rec call. <laughs> sorry, I'm just trying to save a bit of space here. So, so it takes something of type request collection. So let me rename this from requests to rec here so it's a request collection and clearly I mean you, you have to um, you have to match this to your scenario right now I'm assuming that the requests are saved in memory only and that's why we're using a data structure but but maybe this would be uh, an object that's sort of in your ORM that maps to your da database or maybe it's like your actual database connection but I think probably would be, be cool if this request response thing could happen or could be decoupled from, from which particular database you're using, right? So that you're not sort of statically calling the database or database from uh, or within the response. But anyways, I mean, if we think about sort of dependency injection and sort of um, only in memory, like within the nice controlled world of our application, I think this would kind of make sense. You pass the request collection to the response and it determines uh, what the matching request is. So then, the question, I guess, here is, is should it find that and then return it or should it find that and then do the next thing? I guess actually maybe it should do the next thing, right? Because if you, if you find the request, or let me put it this way, this hypothetically could fail, right? It's a lookup. So it could be that we're in a state in the application where this lookup doesn't work. Like it's, it's like, well, you asked me to find something that has this ID, but I don't have anything that has that ID. So hypothetically that could happen. So because of that, we should probably not find and then return because then we would have to return null and then we have to do null checking and all that stuff. So rather this would have to do the next step. So let's figure out what the next step is, right? So, so now we've done this, find request of, of response, right? And I'm not actually implementing the algorithm of that, but I mean, clearly you've already figured out how to uh, do that, right? Like, well, obviously you know how to do that. Um, so step number four here is, is that we were saying that, okay, a request plus a response, informally plus, right, in plus a response should uh, equate, should be, it should be possible to tr transform a request and a response to a file, right? Or actually, I mean, it's like there, there's a function that takes a, a, a request and then a response and then yields a file, right? So in some sense, a request plus a response is a file. So, what does that mean? That means we need some information from the request, we need some information from the response, and we need to turn that into a file. And actually, if we think about it, in, in just the simplest sense, what we need is that from the response, we need the file ID. Or actually, I mean, we need the URLs, right? That's the thing, we need the, the URLs that we've generated. So let's, let's get to that in a moment. But, in the trivial, in the most trivial sense, we need the file ID from the response, but from the request, we need the user ID, right? So that's the sort of two pieces that we need. And since we have this thing where we need one thing from here and one thing from here, I would probably, now I'm just sort of guessing on the fly, but I would probably not put that logic in neither the response nor the request because we need to ask one of them at least for their information. And then I would probably prefer to ask both, 
Okay, so so I would probably have another class here, which is hmm, which is a, a file factory or something like this. Right? So so there is something like a file factory, and if you think about it, that actually makes sense. So let's say oh let has something that's that's called something like make file, right? And the file factory probably has multiple different types, right? Because you probably have, so I'm just using simplified notation here, you, you probably have one for an S3 image, and you probably have one for uh, an S3 video, and, and so forth, and another one for a, what was this last thing that we had, DB, so this is the problem with me writing very poorly, a uh, DB image, I guess. <laughs> so DB image, right? So, and the reason I say they are different is because the implementation of make file would be different because they would read, let's think about this carefully now, they would read different properties from, so they would read, hmm, but this probably doesn't work, right? What I was going to say is that they would read, we would sort of construct or inject them with an S3 image, an S3 video, or a DB. Hmm. Yeah, actually, this doesn't work. This is so. So now, when I was saying that I would choose not to put the logic in one of these, actually, I'm wrong. I have to put the logic here, right? We have to put the creation logic here because requests are all the same, but responses vary, right? So we don't have type information in request. We do have type in, like subtype information. We do have subtype information in the response. And if we go to some form of file factory solution, well, somebody needs to create that file factory. And then it's probably this thing that creates the file factory, but it's going to be, but the file factory is going to be coupled to some specific subtype here. And it can't interact with it in a gen gen general way, right? Because the, the, the fields might be different for these different responses. So then it's probably not a shared factory, right? Then we just have sort of simple concretions of factories. And that probably doesn't make sense because then the creation logic should be here. So, so yeah, so I would say, no, 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 let's not do this, right? Let's not go to unnecessary complication, right? If this is firm, if there's only one type of request, that we can express under this sort of unified interface, then it makes sense to put the creation logic here to, to say build, build file, right? Build file or something like that. Or make file or new file or whatever. Create file. But, oh, sorry, actually, it needs to be in the interface, right? Not in the concretion, I meant here, of course. So uh, build file. So, Yeah, so probably this needs to take the request collection. Let's, let's think about this in a moment, but let's just uh, go full circle by saying that if we start to have variation here, right? if we start to have subtypes of the request, I would assume like maybe, like maybe we're in a visitor pattern scenario then, because then we're back into this place where we have to match a specific request type with a specific response type, and actually probably that makes sense. So I would probably go towards something like that because that also gives us a logical place to handle the issue where we have, where we for some observed reason happen to have a request of the wrong type matched with the response of the wrong type. Or I mean, a request of one type matched with a response of a type that doesn't actually, or isn't actually supposed <clears throat> to, be, to be matched with that request type. So that gives us a logical place to handle that because then I mean, you think about visitor pattern is, or the intent of visitor pattern is to recover lost type information. But anyways, now, now I think that's, that's overkill for now. Probably now it's better to put build file here in the response, right? So, so, so let's, let's go back here, right? We were, we were saying, okay, the request plus the response needs to be turned into a file. So if user ID of the request is a public property and if the response can find the request, then we could, we could probably skip this, exposing this find request uh, method and instead we just expose this build file and then we write this for clarity or let's say let's say new file new file and we pass the request collection to that instead right so, so internally what it would do is that would is that it would first 
find the matching request from the request collection, read the user ID from that, read whatever stuff it needs to read from its own concretion, and then construct the file. So then we actually have this file. Right? And that file, also actually, sorry, we need to make that class as well. So, so that's a file class, which definitely ha ha has ha ha two fields, which, which would be uh, user ID and file ID. Sorry, I shouldn't say definitely. I mean, uh, within the way we've structured it now, it would probably make sense to think of it as having uh, these uh, these two properties, but you might not actually in reality want to expose these properties uh, Now I get a bit confused about UML in regards to whether I should draw this arrow or not I mean in some sense response has a concrete dependency on file because it creates files But what I mean specifically is that when we call new file here uh, We get back something of type file so the response can construct the file. Now the interesting part here is of course that you remember how I said that we're trying to avoid null by making response do sort of the next thing but apparently now we're still in a scenario where the new file could be null because we could get back uh, null. I mean if we don't find something then yes we can skip um, constructing the file but still we don't have anything to return so then we have to return null anyways but anyways let's see if, I mean Hopefully you could get rid of this in the future, but but th th that's at least uh, I think that's at least a, a step in the right direction. Okay, let let's check out the next thing. So so that's actually four crossed over, right? We now have a concrete file which contains the user ID and the file ID. And actually, by the way, before we move into step five here, let me just mention that I would actually separate the request collection from the file collection, like. I wouldn't save the responses in the database because the, the responses we could use to construct files immediately, assuming we have access to the request collection. But I would probably separate requests from files uh, in order to not have to traverse the collection of files whenever I'm looking for a whenever I'm searching for a request. But also because otherwise it's like we have this table in our data database with uh, that's called maybe file and it has, let's say, a URL field, which is always null, 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 null for all of the requests. So I would prefer to just call that something else, right? I would prefer to move all of those things to its own entity, right? And to, to its own entity that's, that, that models what it is, like it, it models the request, right? In, instead of assuming it's a file, even though it hasn't been uploaded yet, it also makes a bunch of other things easier, right? Like you don't have to decide what type to, to create here. Or rather, if, if I put it this way, if you have an ORM that matches your, your entity to, to a model within your uh, code base, then, then that model has a property which could be null. You don't have that scenario if you separate the two types. But also, I was thinking about something else. What was that? Whew. Um, normalization. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of something else, I can't, I can't remember. But, but uh, probably I, I think that makes a lot of sense to sort of do that separation and have, have two different tables. Ah, what I was thinking about was this. I, I, uh, if you want to do cleanup of requests, if you want to remove request information when uh, the request has been fulfilled, let's say, that would be trivial because then you would just, you could clear um, requests. Of course, it wouldn't be trivial because you would have to figure out which requests are fulfilled or not unless you update that when you fulfill them. So, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's not obvious. It's not obvious which is the best solution, but I would probably separate them and then think a bit more about that problem further down the line. But initially I would separate them because they really feel like two different things. Okay, um, so then we have the file, right? And then we might put the file in uh, the request, uh, or sorry, not in the request collection, but rather in the, uh, let's say, file collection. So again, you have to think that, okay, if I'm talking about the file collection here in memory, that would mean, that would map to something like your data database, like that would map to the file table in your database. So actually, now, now we did solve this problem, right? If we don't return file here, but if this is actually void, and if we don't make a new file, but rather we pass in the request collection, oh, this is going to look very messy. Let me, let me redraw this whole thing. So 
So we have a response, huge. <laughs> and what it does is that it has a void instance method that's called, um, uh, let's say, I don't know, something like save. Or, or new or whatever, let, let me just say save a file. And we pass it both a request collection and a, uh, sorry, not a response collection, but a, a file collection. And what it does is that it matches the file uh, that the response contains with the request collection or, or, or with the request from the request collection with the appropriate request from the request collection and then it puts that into uh, the file collection. So hmm, I don't know whether that's, that's more sensible or not. So like, let me just as a parenthesis, right? And we're not gonna look at the alternative, but maybe you would actually give response less responsibility by not doing all of those things in the response, but, but by then simply returning things outwards because I mean you do have to null check within response now probably um, because you would still do a find or something like this right maybe depends I mean if you do sort of this if you do a filter here um, and then operate and then map over that filter so you operate on sort of a collection level then probably you could avoid null checking here but then we're in sort of functional programming land and all of this stuff all right, but let's stick with this now. I mean, I would not argue against you if you would argue that response should return uh, something directly, which is, for example, a file. So it just does the matching and then it returns the file. And then it's the next thing's responsibility, such as the collection, for example, to, to map to put that in the file collection. Actually, yeah, now, now that I'm saying that, like probably that makes a lot of sense, right? Because otherwise, I mean, the reason we have this response is that some of the things vary across images in S3 and DB or Dropbox and, and images and all that stuff, like the, across that axis of, of uh, variation or varies across that axis. But the way we put things in the file collection probably doesn't do that. That's probably the same. Yeah, so let's, yeah, 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 let's, let's not do this. It's a silly idea. So let's just say new file, right? New file, and we pass it the request collection. It's not that it returns void, but rather it returns a file, right? Probably makes sense. You could probably, ah, we should, we should alleviate this problem by returning a null file, right? If we have, so either we return a file or we return a null file potentially, or something like that. You could probably use the null object pattern in order to alleviate the null problem. But anyways, then you get back a, uh, a, uh, a file, or a null file, <laughs> and, and then your client code would take that file and put it into the file collection. Right? And then we are, we are sort of full circle where we received the request, we, we initiated the request, ah, sorry, we received the request, we put the, we not receive the request, we, we received the request to create a request that we want to upload the file, the user wants to upload the file. So we construct the request, we save the request into the database, we initiate the request, we wait some time, randomly we get back a response that could be matched with any of the requests, we have to figure out which one. So, so we construct this re response uh, in instance and we pass it the request collection so that it can match which request it, it, it should be matched with or so that it can answer which one it should be matched with. And then yeah, we construct a new file from that. And depending on which subtype we're in here and which subtype we're in is determined by which URL was called by the thing that, or by the place where we're uploaded, where we are uploading the file to. Sorry, in other words, the, the which URL was called depends on which storage we are uploading to. So, so the way we're interacting with the storage. And so we, we get that back. Or so, so it constructs a new file and constructs a new file in different ways, uh, yes, it, it, it uh, interacts with the requests, but the requests are all sort of quotation marks the same, like the type is the same, but the responses have different uh, structure. And for that reason, the response is responsible for constructing uh, the file. So we then have a file and then whoever uh, in, in interacted with the response, like we were saying, maybe the controller, right? That thing, so, so let's say maybe this is a controller, 
or like in the design pattern videos, we often call this a client, like somebody who interacts with the calls, right? Not the client as in the user. So that thing interacts with the response and then it would interact with the file collection by, by taking this file and putting it into the file collection. So it, essentially saving the file. Okay, so this is sort of really full circle, right? The, the, the thing left that we haven't talked about now is this number five, right? So let's try to figure, so, so let's try to figure out this, this last point five, right? What we would call the compute prop. So essentially what we meant is that, well, if you have an image at Amazon S3, for example, they might generate multiple versions of that image in, for example, multiple sizes, and then you want to save URLs to those different uh, images uh, within the file. So, so importantly, I guess the first realization that we have to make is that file is not actually a single uniform type. Like we might have, so sorry for drawing this a bit, a bit funny, but we might have multiple different implementations of file where probably, right, probably we have something like image. Wow, this is, sorry, I need to draw this a bit more seriously. Image and video and then maybe What's this one? Well, uh, document we were talking about, for example, let me just say doc and then write image a bit more clear here. So image. So those are different implementations of file or those are di different concretions of file. So notice how I'm not varying these across the axis of storage. I'm only varying them across the axis of it's storable, right? The different things that we can store, but it's not like an S3 image and an S3 video, but maybe you would need to do that, right? I would assume you maybe don't need to do that. Like when you have a file uploaded and you want to use that file in your application, probably the URL is the only thing uh, that you need. Like the URL is the thing that, that tells you where the file is, but maybe, again, like maybe, images have multiple different versions of them and then uh, then maybe uh, for, for that reason maybe you would have uh, different type like image would be a different type from video actually sorry now I went went overboard I, I, I realize I now remember sorry we were talking about this in the beginning you were saying that you were using this hash of, of uh, sort of URLs where where you map different keys to different uh, to different values. Actually, let me follow along in, in, in this structure because actually I think this might make sense. So maybe you could get rid of that hash and, and simply use different subtypes. Um, but that of course depends also on how you want to save it in, within the file collection. Like if we would do it this way, I would probably rather than having a file collection, I would probably have a, a database table for images and a database table for videos and a database table for, for documents. But I mean, I do appreciate the fact that maybe, maybe it's not as trivial as that, right? Maybe if we just keep on sort of following this thread, right? Maybe actually in the future, let's say, let's say Dropbox has one implementation of general, maybe that's unlikely, but let's say uh, Google Drive, if you upload images to Google Drive, Google Drive generates three versions of your image. But if you upload to Amazon S3, they generate five versions of your image. So how do we unify these interfaces, right? Or how do we unify these different, yeah, I guess interfaces actually. So, so like you might have sort of low, mid and high in, in Dropbox and you might have I don't know, banner and da da da. All right, it was like, this is like different keys for these things, right? Like they're fundamentally, they're, they're in some sense fundamentally different. So actually maybe you would, I, I, I shouldn't say would need to, I, I think you should maybe consider the idea of breaking apart this hash into a more complex stru structure such as a one-to-many relationship so that a, a file, ah, oh, but actually that's what you're doing with the collection, right? A file points to a number of different URLs. Yeah, sorry, actually, I mean, that's what you're doing. But what I'm suggesting is that you would turn that turn them into types. So you would use them, you would construct different classes. So like, this is maybe an, an image file, but then there's maybe something like an image version. Is this actually visible if I draw down here? Yeah, that's, that's fine. So there's maybe an image version, right? So <clears throat> an image has multiple image versions. So then the image would be stored in one table in the database and image versions would be stored in, in, in another table in the database. So image versions are essentially then just URLs. But then actually maybe, 
yeah, I'm not... <laughs> I do realize the issue, I mean, it's not obvious because, I mean, what would we save here? No, but probably that would make sense, right? Because, like, if you think about it in terms of a, in terms of a web application, you probably want to present images differently. Hmm, yeah, but maybe you could actually do that with a hash as well. Sorry, so I'm realizing now I'm being unnecessarily confusing and I'm not sure of the value of introducing this additional type yet. So, so let me, let me stop here and say instead that, okay, let's just say that we have different types for images and videos and documents, because then if you have an image, for example, you want to render that image on a web page, you, you could just iterate over the collection of URLs and download the image and display that image, right? I mean, I guess the issue here is again that the, the keys are not maybe aligned between the different types. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna glance over this because I'm not entirely sure what you're actually after, right? But but let me go full circle with, with the other, with, with, with this in relation to the other pieces that we talked about and hopefully you can see how you could use use that to your advantage or potentially use these newly introduced types to your advantage. So, so essentially the next realization that we have to make is that if we have these different types, images or image and video and document, and they are all files, but responses create file, then I mean, if the response is the one responsible for creating file, then it's the one that calls new, right? It's the one that constructs, like calls the constructor of some particular subtype of file. Or I mean, I'm saying subtype here, but this would probably be in, or uh, should presumably be, or I would suggest that it should be an interface rather than a, a parent type, rather than a super fast. Um, so so it, it constructs something of type file, but it needs to decide which one. And, and that means that it, of course, is the responsibility of the S3 image or the S3 video or, or, the, or the DB image or the Dropbox image. So, so that's, in some sense, the place where we should put this logic of computing properties from the basis of, of these URLs. And I don't think it would be, like depending on how complex the logic is, I wouldn't say it's insane to put that directly in this, in this method. But I mean, maybe this method starts to do, starts to grow, right? Like, I mean, use some kind of rule of five or something like that. Like if, if you have to express it in something more than five-ish lines, like five to 10-ish lines, probably you should extract some kind of object here. So, so then you could trivially extract some, some ob object, which is, or, or some class, which is, Sorry, I should say, what, what class? Uh, so some class. You should extract some class which is specifically responsible for parsing um, or computing these properties. So, so computing the properties that are appropriate given that you have an S3 image. So, so we should decide whether we want to construct an, uh, an, in, uh, like, uh, an image, a video, or a document at the place where we actually have that knowledge. And, and that knowledge we have when we know whether we have a response, which is a response from uh, Amazon S3 in regards to an image, or Amazon S3 in regards to the video, or Dropbox in regards to an image, and so forth and so forth and so forth, right? That's the place where we have that subtype information, so we should make use of it at that place. But again, like we could construct another class that, specific, that, that specifically work with that parsing, right? So, so I wouldn't say that it's insane if we say that an S3 image has uh, like an S3, I don't know, like, image response uh, parser, let's say, right? Or, or like property computer, right? Like, like that, that would be its own super specialized class that only exists for, for, the, uh, for the sake of, of parsing some information given that we have a, 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 a request for some user. Or actually, I mean, probably the request shouldn't have to be involved. Probably it's just a response, right? Given that we have a response with some particular ID. And, and I mean, I wouldn't say that it's controversial then to say that, okay, this, this could be a super specialized class that doesn't share any interface with anything else. Like, think about it this way. It's like if you were in functional programming, that's a very specialized function that's sort of ad hoc on the fly in order to do some particular thing. Like, that's the thing that it's specialized at. Right? Like we're just extracting it into a function. But since we're an object-oriented programming, when we're extracting functions, we're usually talking about extracting it into a class, right? Rather than making an, an instance method of something, right? 
because if we're making it an instance method, it's probably a private instance method. And if it's a private instance method, it could just as well be its class, like it could be self-contained. So yeah, <laughs> anyways. And the same thing would go for the video and the image and so forth. Like, if for those of the, for the, for the things that require more complex logic, I wouldn't say that it's insane to extract another specialized class for doing that particular thing. But anyways, <laughs> so these would then construct the files, and then we've solved also the, the property computation problem, right? The problem of, of deciding which, uh, or, or the, the, the problem of computing some uh, values from some particular piece of, of uh, uh, yeah, potentially, like from some particular piece of the response. So, so that's essentially very, very specific, so it needs to be within the subtypes. And actually, I mean, I said now that the S3 image would use one S3 image response parser, but like maybe it actually uses multiple classes. Maybe, right? It depends on how complex this, this property computation is. Like maybe it would need to calculate multiple things. I don't know. It depends. Uh, okay. There was one thing I wanted to say more, which... Let's, let's try to figure out something more about around this confusion, right? Like, so, so then we would return either an image or a video or a document. But yeah, I mean, I, I think you probably can see what I'm saying in, in regards to that. Since you have the ability to construct different subclasses here, you would then, you, it's also in some sense then trivial to take the next step and say, well, okay, I had this hash of different URLs. Let me now construct, let me now f f break out this hash and, and turn it into more classes, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to say something about static and dynamic typing, but like, I mean, the issue, the issue with hashes is that we, we move to primitives and the issue with primitives is that we can't replace conditional with polymorphism. So the unit of abstraction, sorry for repeating myself, in an object oriented programming is the object, right? So we should make sure to use objects and yeah, I, I know that. And that, that strings are objects in, in, in Ruby, for example, I guess. But, but, uh, but they're not objects in the sense that we should monkey patch instance methods to them that we want to have uh, that are specific to images and videos and, and documents. Like those are some very specific types. So, or, or sorry, it, it was not actually these. It, it was in regards to URLs. Like, like URL, a URL is a very special type of a string. So. Uh, so whenever we can constrain the domain of a type away from primitives, I think generally we should. That's generally a good idea because then we have the ability to replace conditionals with polymorphism. Anyways, um, so, so you have the ability to choose which subtype you create here and then you can extend that further. One final last thing, okay. I made the assumption, I made the assum I made the assumption that we control the the request that we make to, uh, or the, the, the uh, sorry, I, I mean, I, I made the assumption that we control the response that we get back from uh, the 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 web server from the from the storage from the external storage from the storage API, right? If we don't, if we don't control that, then we don't have this sort of nice match. I mean, notice how there's there's no arrow between these things, right? I mean, these are sort of disconnected because they are, uh, they are only connected in the network sense. And like when we get the network request back, then that's when we end up with a response. But we don't know which response, which, which subtype, I should switch colors here. We don't know which subtype of a response to create if we don't have a controlled URL. Like if we can't control the specific URL that's, that's called, so if we're in that scenario, there is also another problem, which is the URL parsing, right? Like the determining of, given that I have this particular response, which particular response subtype should I create? But again, then we're back to the point of that. I would, I would say that that's a necessary problem to solve. Not, not um, so I was going to say good as in, not as in that, yay, we have that problem. I mean, it's a terrible problem, like all, or I shouldn't say that, but like clearly we would rather not have the problem. But if we have that problem, then I think it makes sense. It's a good thing. That's what I should say. It's a good thing to try to solve that problem. So it's good to, as quickly as possible, move away from, from like the raw response to our own control type again, so that we can use polymorphism. So, so I would probably then construct 
another class which is specifically responsible for mapping uh, uh, responses like the I mean probably it's not the, the raw HTTP responses but like let's say the the JSON contained uh, in within the response or something like that right uh, so so I, I would create a class that's responsible for mapping from from that raw data from the from the raw JSON response to one of these one of these subtypes so that we could do the rest of the stuff again like within the context of the application or, or <laughs> within the nice boundaries of our application uh, so so using our own types and and not uh, by having to do this sort of uh, str string parsing or like checking different properties to figure out whether it comes from Amazon or whether it's an image or whether it's something else like and so forth so so as quickly as possible figure that out move to an actual type and then do it like the, the, whichever way you would want to do it, right? Like to the, use your own own types because you can control those types. So, whew. okay, longest response in the history of the world. I, I hope this kind of uh, helped in, in, in regards to the issue. I mean, if I, if I generalize the points that, that I tried to make here, I, I guess it's something along the lines of introducing more classes, right? We're in object-oriented programming, so don't be afraid of extracting more classes that have very, very narrow responsibility, single responsibility principle. And in some sense, think, think of it that way, right? Like, I, I, I keep thinking of functional programming versus object-oriented programming. Like, in functional programming, you construct functions for everything. In object-oriented programming, we, we construct objects for everything. So, so clearly, if an object is like a function, then objects should have super, super narrow responsibilities or, or very spe specific responsibilities. And, and the second thing I, I would say is uh, mutability. Like notice how we're not changing properties of these different instances. Like we have these classes and the responsibilities of these classes are to, um, to, uh, to compute things out of things, right? it's not to change themselves and, and they don't change each other, right? Actually, I mean, it's not entirely true because we were now saying that the controller would actually change the file collection and the controller would then probably, a different controller would probably change the request collection by putting the request in that collection. Um, but I mean, if, if we're, if by saying the file collection and the request collection, we actually sort of informally are talking about a, a, a database table, then clearly that would be mutation, right? So, so I think it's it's probably a good thing that we moved away from the file collection or from the response putting things into the file collection directly when we had that this return void here instead, uh, because then suddenly this new file uh, instance method of the response would not have been. Uh, uh, pure. Right? It would it would actually have mutated the state of something else, but I mean there are sort of pros and cons to both of these things. We are in object oriented programming after after all. But yeah, so 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 the second point I guess I, I would like to emphasize is, is sort of immutability, like um, actually I mean purity in some sense, but 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 at least immutability. So try to avoid uh, mutation. When, when things get out of hand, right? Like things become increasingly or, or significantly uh, more, more uh, reasonable or, 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 or simple, right? They become significantly more simple when, when we stop to mute, when we stop mutating things because it becomes easier to reason about what happens within the program, like what's the flow within the program because we can think about isolated pieces without having to think about anything else. We can think about, okay, well, if the response takes a request connection and uh, returns a file. Well, okay, then it's it's probably just some pure computation where it's like, well, given some contents of the request collection, it will construct a file of some particular sorts. Like that's sort of not trivial, but like simple thing to think about as opposed to it putting things into the file collection. But anyways, okay, sorry, <laughs> now I'm rambling. Super good, I hope that makes sense. Excellent question. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any more questions, check out the description and do ping me with more questions. Apart from that, if you sticked within the video this far, kudos to you. <laughs> and I will see you in the next video.